Rich but foolish is a very strange combination that a person can be rich and still foolish. I'll use the story that you are very familiar with, but I'm going to present it in a way and manner that I think will give you understanding and uh, you can take this home and, and buy a copy of it because it's going to be very, very important to your life and to your future in the days ahead. Our stewardship of our resources is very important to life and relationship. Uh, I started out broke myself. I was broke. I didn't have anything apart from the piece of paper you get from the university when you graduate. And, um, but over the years, I've learned some things I'm going to share with you today. I've been around for a while and I've been a Christian for the greater part of my life. Uh, and even, I've even been a minister for lesser. But for the greater part, I've been a child of God and everything that I have today and which has come into me and through me, into me and my life and even through my life has been a result of God honoring his word. Our stewardship of our resources uh, is very important. It's very important to life and our relationship to God. Our stewardship, the word stewardship in the Greek is the word oikomono. Oikomono, that is the Greek word for stewardship. And uh, Greek uh, is a very rich word, I mean, rich language that when you read it, you need to understand uh, it can mean so many things and it can bring out some truths which you cannot find in one word many, many times. So, the word oikomono is where we get the word economy. If you write it down, you notice that it's, it looks like it. Economy. And what's economy? Well, the use of resources, human and financial resources, and also the management of uh, the forces of demand and supply. That's what, that's what economy is. How I many of you read economy in school? Okay, so am I correct? At least by, by, from this pulpit, I'm correct. Okay. <laughs> That's a general and broad definition of what economy is. So that is what we're talking about this morning. When I say stewardship, I'm talking about the economy. The economics, sorry. The economics of finances. Your stewardship speaks volumes about your inner life and your spiritual life. In other words, the way you spend your money speaks volume. It makes us to know your spirit even without seeing your spirit. You never really know how important your stewardship is until you have more than enough. Let me explain that. You never really know how important your stewardship is until you have more than enough. There was a time I was earning 500 naira a month. There isn't much to talk about there because uh, the house rent was 160 naira a month. The, the transport money to work every week was about, uh, every month was about uh, a little over 100. My tithe was just 50 naira, and the remaining give for food. There's not much you can talk about there. But when your when money begins to come more than <laughs> you, really, you really need to live, because you see, God blesses people, He blesses everyone, and He's watching the way you spend it. That is one thing you've got to know this morning. And the way you spend your money speaks volumes. And your, the way you spend money becomes important when it becomes more like this. If you have 10 million naira today, suddenly 10 million naira comes to your hand. The way you spend it is going to be important. But if all you have is 1,000 naira, just enough money to take you back home. <laughs> We're going to ask you too many questions. But when you have more, then the stewardship becomes important. Jesus responded to the people of his days with a parable that can be captioned rich but foolish that's what jesus did in an attempt to help us he spoke to the people of his days who are just like us they're just ordinary people regular people like us and he was teaching us the subject and that's why i'm going to use this subject it's a strange combination for a person to be rich and to be foolish but it reflects the challenges of faithful stewardship rich but foolish you can be rich and yet foolish. That reflects that there's a serious challenge with stewardship. That is, a person can be wise and be poor. Some people can be foolish, but they can be rich. 
Okay? You take time to think about it as you go home. You can't really be rich unless you are wise. I can assure you, you can never really be rich unless you are a wise person. That is, it takes wisdom. The wisdom of this world, the wisdom of finances, the wisdom of businesses, I mean, uh, the wisdom that comes from being able to put things together to sell or to offer for sale so that people can make you rich. But the wisdom for life is different from the wisdom for riches. The wisdom for life, the wisdom to live, which is lacking in many people, is lacking. It's, 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 it's different from the wisdom to be rich. That is, somebody can have the wisdom for riches and not have the wisdom for life. And that is why the resources that come into our hearts, our lives, we are not careful to be wise enough. We find out that uh, we become broke and we become foolish. Wisdom is indeed needed for everything. Wisdom is needed in life. You can never really live a successful life without wisdom. And so I'm going to read my text now. And if you do have the Bible, you want to open to it. Luke chapter 12. And I'll read very quickly from verses 14. The context of that prayer, I mean of that, um, of that parable. Luke 12 verse 14. Luke's gospel. I've seen miracles, financial miracles in people's lives, which I knew was God, you know. Um, and I know many of us have all kinds of miracles happening to our lives. But I'm telling you, the greatest miracles happen to those who are wise and not to foolish people. Luke 12, verse 14. And he said unto him, man, Okay, let me take verse 13. And one of the company, just people in the crowd, said unto Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. He was talking money now. He said, we have an inheritance. We want to divide it. But my brother is not wanting to divide it. He wants to keep everything for himself. Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them. Now Jesus begins to speak to everybody now, not just to the man that asked the question. Take heed. And that's an alarm right there. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's a very, very important subject we can speak on someday in the future. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do that because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take that ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. That's like saying, fall down and die. Then whose, whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he see that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he sent unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor burn. And God feeded them, feeded them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Which of you with taking thought can add to a stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his wisdom was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is, so, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more? Will he clothe you, O you of little faith? It says in verse 29, And seek not ye that ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. <laughs> Underline that in your Bible. Don't be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure 
to give you the kingdom. May the Lord bless those words to our hearts in Jesus' name. Very, very important discourse Jesus is having right here. And he's speaking to people like you and I, and I who have financial challenges. Nigeria is going through a recession now. Many of your businesses have also gone on recession. So many do not have jobs. Those who have jobs are, are, are just managing it. It's not what they really want. Things are really hard. There's no doubt about that. But Jesus knew that when he said this. He knew today will come. He knew that it was important that we understood the principles of stewardship, which is the essence of this discussion. And Jesus was very, very emphatic in telling them what to do. He didn't just say, just continue to struggle, just continue to live. No, he told them what to do. And that's what I'm going to do in the next few minutes. Let me make my initial thoughts. Number one, my initial thoughts on the subject of rich but foolish. The natural man, that is you and I, has a real challenge with covetousness for which he needs help greatly. We all have problems with covetousness. It's natural. That is the flesh. That is the way we are made because since man fell, man began to think about himself alone. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the bane of human living. We all have the challenge that we, we, would, rather, we would rather be selfish. So when you see somebody giving something, <laughs> it is not a normal thing. Like I always say to you, to be blessed is normal. But to be a blessing is divine. It goes beyond the natural human way of reasoning and doing things. Number two, I want you to know for the longest day you live, and this is one of the revelations God gave me as a young man. God wants you to have abundance. That is the will of God. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be rich. That is God's desire. That is the heart of God. If you can get to God and meet him anywhere and ask him, Lord, what is your will for my finances? He wants you to be blessed. And you see, it is revealed in this discourse because in verse 28, Jesus said, if then God so close the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he close you? How much more? You see, many Christians think God doesn't want me to have. If you're a Christian, you should not have. If you're a Christian, you should be poor. Listen, the, the, the longest day you live, it is the desire of God that you have. I want you to know that. Don't ever doubt that. That's why, that's why I say, oh, you have little faith. He wants me to have. So the question is, why don't I have? Even though it is the desire of God for me. I want you to know that. As a young man, I, I got this revelation. I got that if I seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I'll be blessed. I just knew it. As I grew up in the faith, I was a young man in school. When I just came out of school, I just had a little job where I was paid 500 naira a month. I just knew that I, I would not be like this forever. And so what did I do? I tried to be a Christian. I tried to be the best Christian I could be. Go to fellowship, go to church, pray, read my Bible, do my work, of course, go to work every morning, <laughs> the best I could, and I put by my seat in my office, God's architect. I felt God was my employer. I wasn't working for my employer, I was working for God. I wish I took a picture of that place then because I had a little cubicle as a, as a young architect, a pupil architect, so to speak, and I wrote God's architect. And I knew God would bless me. I knew I'd be blessed. I can say, I was poor. I was this poster I saw somewhere of a monkey. The monkey was eating banana and it wrote there, I was poor. Now I'm rich. Rich is better. I said, if a monkey knows that, then Christians should know that too. God wants me blessed. Everybody say, God wants me blessed. Second Chronicles, Corinthians, sorry, chapter 9, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. God, God is able to make all grace abound towards me. God is able to, because he wants to, make all grace abound towards me that I always have sufficiency. God doesn't want me to be broke. He doesn't. He wants me to be rich. You know, the Bible also says that there are always the poor people amongst us. Well, people choose to be poor. And God knows there will be people that will be poor. That's not saying that he wants people to be poor. He wants everybody to be rich. Number three. Your stewardship of resources that he gives you can determine the 
eventual outcome of your life, your stewardship, the way you spend 500 naira will, will, will affect whether you get 500,000 naira. <laughs> the way you spend 10,000 that he gives you now will determine other things. That's what we find out here. And that is the wisdom that you need to get and that you are not foolish. You need to have that wisdom that you are not foolish. The wisdom you need to get is that your stewardship of what you have can determine what you will eventually have. We'll see it in the story of the man immediately. Number four, God distributes resources with his work in mind. When God puts money in people's hands, it is with his work in mind. Let me say that, and I'll prove that in just verse 21. He says, so it is that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. <laughs> he said, this man is not rich towards God. That is his problem. That's stewardship. How do you spend it? I watch the way people spend their money. The way they dress, the clothes they wear, the car they drive, the kind of food they eat. That's all to spend money on. And the house you live in. Those are the kind of things you spend money on. And then I look at their children sometimes. I see people's, people's perspective when I look at their children. The way the children dress. The kind of school they go to. The way they look. Some children are so malnourished. And mommy and daddy are wearing to match. Children can hardly pay their school fees. But daddy and mommy are spending a lot of money on their clothes. See? See worship. See people that buy a brand new car and they don't even remember to pay their tithe or pay some silly tithe see that's still worship it speaks volumes and i say it can determine uh, god distributes resources with his work in mind i tell you there are three reasons that god gives us money number one to enjoy ourselves number two for the sake of the gospel number three for the sake of the poor now those are the three reasons God gives money into our hands and you must remember that when money comes into your hand those are the three reasons many people do like it's all for them and that's one of the mistakes this man made I will begin to talk about that in a minute I want you to know that God distributes resources with his work in mind you are expected to be rich towards God very important so when did God become displeased with this man when did God become displeased with him? The truth is this. If you look at this man's case, he was rich. If you look at verse 16, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He was rich before this further riches happened to him. Did you get that? He was rich before. He didn't become rich by this sudden wealth. He was already a rich man. But God wanted to change his level. God wanted to move him on. To the next level. When did God become displeased with him? Why do I say that? If a man is blessed, it's an act of God, and the person has favor with God. That's why God blesses him. Even if you're a sinner, even if you don't you, you use your money to, <laughs> to, 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 to fight the gospel, whatever money comes into a man's hands, an act of God. So when did God become displeased with him? I will give you four things that made God to be displeased with this man. Four of them. Number one, he failed to acknowledge God as his source. There is silence in heaven now. Everybody is very quiet. When you talk about money, everybody becomes quiet. This man failed to acknowledge God as source. That was a mistake. He must have attributed it to everything. But certainly, he didn't attribute it to God. Because there was no mention of God in his thoughts at all. That was not good. And he did not, God was not happy with it. The Bible is clear. John chapter 3 verse 37. A man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. A man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. <laughs> and you see it is important you see when I came back from England in 2005 I was broke very very broke I spent all the money I had on paying hospital bills 
cost over a hundred thousand pounds then i was flat broke and i don't do any job all i do is preach and take an allowance which is not even enough it's not up to what i use i could easily have earned if i tried to work and god began i began to speak to god i said god i'm broke financially broke now because why god is my employer i talked to him as my employer i said god i'm broke i know that god is my source and god made a promise using the scriptures that what the devil has told him he will restore many fold that's what he told me <laughs> and i knew that there's nobody in this church indeed in this ministry that could have restored what i had i mean you don't you don't even have enough for yourself most of you so i knew it would, it have to be it would have to be an act of god i can stand here before god almighty god being before god almighty being my witness the amount of money that god made to come into my hands in all kinds of ways is <laughs> i've never seen that kind of money before i'd never even when i was running practice and i was running about the place trying to do this and do that the things that god brought into my hand within this past 10 years is absolutely phenomenal because God is my source. And I acknowledge that there's nothing good. Actually, when I got the first check that was out of this world, that was in 2010 or so, I said, God, I said, what is this for? My children are all, they have all finished school. They are all married. What am I going to use this for? I have to say that to God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need this kind of money, as a matter of fact. And I didn't know what to do with it because I, it was god that gave it to me i went to him i said what what will you do with this why do you do me this i know there are people that cannot pay school fees cannot pay children cannot pay house rent do not want to buy land i don't need any, i have a house of my own i have a car i have i don't i want to use it for <laughs> the bible says in james chapter 1 verse 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above everybody says from above, above. say it very well it's from above every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness neither shadow of turning <laughs> the bible says in first corinthians 4 verse 7 what do you have that you did not receive that's nothing you have that you didn't receive you didn't come to this world with anything like job said naked we come naked shall we go so everything we received it from god but this man did not acknowledge god at all that was a mistake it cost him his life number two he didn't realize that he's supposed to be a mere steward of god's resources that is when god gives you something you are just a steward you don't have to say hey my own my own my own look at him look at the man he thought to himself i think i've counted before about 10 of them he thought within himself, saying, I want you to notice that the man did not say anything. No. He has not done anything. No. He's just thinking. The power of a thought. <laughs> the power of a thought. He said, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods and i will say to my soul that thou that is my soul has much goods i i i i is just a steward i wanted to notice something in verse 16 again the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully which what brought forth plentifully the ground not the man but the man thinks it is him but as a matter of fact it is the ground are you hearing me the money that comes into your hand is coming from god who says everything you plan to grow who says every effort will receive the just recompense of reward no and that was another mistake he didn't realize that he was a steward first peter 4 verse 10 says that we are ministers and good stewards of the manifold grace of god you must be a steward so you consult with him before you spend money he didn't consult with god as he saw the money was coming in he said ah what will i do now let me 
do this, let me do this, let me do this, let me do this, let me do this. He didn't consult. He was rich, but he was a foolish rich man. And I see a lot of Christians like that. The next thing we see is what you spend the money to do. We don't ever see anything in the house of God. God doesn't even, God is not even in your thoughts. And that is a serious matter. Because in this man's case, he was just thinking it. And Jesus was teaching us something here. What is in your thoughts before this money comes? What is in your thought after the money comes? Mistake. It cost him dearly. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 2, let a man so count us as ministers of Christ, every one of us is a minister of Christ, and stewards of the ministry of the mysteries of God. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You must be faithful with what God puts in your hand. It is required. It is required. You don't just put it in your hand and say, do anything you like with it. No. <laughs> Consult him. Especially the kind of money that God will put in some of your hands very soon. I know you say amen. But don't forget what I'm saying now. So that the thing that happened to this man will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Uh -huh. Number three. And this is a very important point. His confidence and complete trust was in his riches and abundance. I said, when did God become angry with this man? His confidence, when his confidence and complete trust was in his riches and abundance he relied on his money for long life for peace for joy for comfort and a secure future he said he said to my soul now that i have put money in the bank now that i've invested very well i said to my soul look at this foolish man he said to his soul take your ease now that i have good laid up for many years take your ease eat drink and be merry <laughs> but god his trust was in his money so he said to his soul now that i'm like my children will say sometimes he said you need to be sorted as always been of sorted he said when you when you don't have any need again you 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 have, you have everything i said that does not guarantee security does not guarantee that you sleep and wake up. There's no guarantee that you even have sleep when you lie on the bed. One of the things we have changed in our house over the years is our bed. I bought a bed when we got married. When the children began to come, I bought another bed. And then I bought another bed. We bought one not long ago, very nice. I like nice things. So I bought this nice bed. But sometimes I'm on that bed and I cannot sleep. It's the best bed we ever had. <laughs> I remember I was in a very fine hotel. I think it was in America. I was describing one hotel to you some time ago that says very fine, you know, I didn't want to leave the place. That hotel is so fine, but I couldn't sleep. <laughs> sleep looks cheap, but <laughs> hey, you can't pay for it. Oh. And God that gives you sleep, you don't remember him. When the money comes, you know. <laughs> and people have all kinds of silly questions. I mean, silly arguments. Tithe. Is it 10% or 5% or uh, before? Is it Old Testament, New Testament? And they begin to argue so that they can be exonerated out of pay, out of giving God anything. Oh, somebody say, well, the way they spend money. I don't like the way they spend money. So they don't give. And then they go give to some other place. Some people eat in one restaurant and pay in another restaurant. Is that how silly that is? You eat in Sherat in Lagos, then come and give Mama put in Ibadan. Because you don't like the way Sherat is running his business. People that think that money is the almighty solution to all problems are fools. And that's why I said this man was rich. But he was a fool. He thought the solution that he had was a solution that is his money that he now had was a solution to long life, security, peace, future. <laughs> you know, people invest in the future. Who promised you a future? Look at our brother. 
We did happy new year together. On the 4th of January, he had gone. That very night, he taught Bible study in his church. <laughs> that very night, and got into the car and then had an accident. <laughs> Nobody promised you anything. The only promise you have is now. But this man thought his money would guarantee his future. <laughs> The Bible says in Proverbs 11 verse 4, Riches profit nothing in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivered from death. <laughs> Proverbs 27 24, Riches are not forever. Now does crown endure to every generation. I've seen many people rich before who are poor now. I've seen many people that left, left a lot of money. I remember there was a commissioner in Lagos State many years ago when he died. He, when he was living, he was very, very frugal. You never see him. He, 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 he didn't look like he was stealing. He was uh, very frugal. He had only Danshiki. And he said, ah, this man is, ah, Baba Kekere. Ni, ah, Baba Kekere. You know, everybody, they respected him. He was very hardworking and everything. And then he died. When he died, the kind of money that he left behind. I'm sure he was planning that when he leaves commission, I will go and spend it. <laughs> I also know of also one army general who was in Nigeria, who, who was sending money to a bank account in the UK. Pound Sterling was sending money there, sending money there, with the plan that when he, when he finishes, he will go and spend it. He told them to buy him a very big house somewhere in London, and he was going to retire there, and I know him personally. Now, the day the man went to the bank in London, he was sending somebody, so they were, they were supposed to be paying the money in. The day he got to the place, and he got to the bank, and he said, my name is so-so-and-so. They said, okay, please, can you check? The Yimbo man, no good, no anybody. He checked the system. He said, 4,000 pounds. He said, no, it's, it's not possible. I said, my name is so-so-and-so. He checked. They said, it's 4,000 pounds. He said, no. He said, he said, hey, hey. He said, security, please, come on. The man he was sending with the money was also taken to another place. And then he would bring a false teller to him. <laughs> Because he couldn't take it himself. You know how foolish people that amass wealth? Look at what is happening in the news now. We are hearing every day of these people that are stealing money. How much money does a man need? How much? Just to eat, drink, and... <laughs> and in that, we don't remember God at all. Yet, we want to go to heaven when we die. First Timothy 6, verse 17 to 19. Paul spoke to Timothy and speaking to every one of us. Chant them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God, who is the one that gives us richly all things to enjoy. Charge the rich in this world that they do good, <laughs> that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute willing to communicate oh glory be to jesus let me take the last point number four when did god become angry with him when he didn't know god's purpose for blessing him with abundance he didn't know the purpose of god <laughs> so he began to say to himself i i i i he didn't know. He didn't know why. He, he wasn't expecting it. He didn't know it would come. He was just, he, he just found it. Like the day I found some credit in my account. Say, what? Where is this coming from? I wasn't expecting. I didn't even think it would be that much. And it was in my name. I had to call. Is it my own? <laughs> he thought it was for himself. Anything that comes into your, into your hand, which is more than the basic things of life can never be for yourself alone. That's a purpose in the mind of God. And God is looking at you like this. Let me see what you will do with this. <laughs> you know when you are broke and you are praying, God is looking at you and saying, hmm, okay, let me see something. Let me do something for this guy. He does something for you and then things come. He's still looking at you like this. Let me see what he's going to do with this. <laughs> God is able to make all grace abound towards us. That we have sufficiency in all things. But it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. When I was going to get married, I was, 
I had only one suit. Somebody gave me this. Somebody gave me this. Somebody gave me this. Everything was yeah, uh, baba uh, bata. Uh, you take a uh, trouser, you take sh- suit, you just manage, manage, manage. But that has changed. <laughs> and it has come by understanding that anything that God puts in your hand is not just for you alone. I discovered that. That's the way you begin to be full, live a full life. Your prosperity is secured even in the time of famine because you have been a good steward. You see, I told you when I was in England that uh, I, I spent so much money, but it wasn't my money, it was people, people gave me so much money. Somebody gave me 5,000 pounds, somebody gave me five. All the doctors, Stone Church doctors, a number of them that live in the UK, they gathered themselves together and they pulled money and they came to my house to give me cash because they know hospital bill is very expensive there, being not a citizen. So they, they thought, oh, let's we help our pastor. People called me from America. People come from everywhere and they were sending money. But I couldn't use it for anything. I had to pay bills. I had nothing. And I said, God, this is a devourer. God says, if you are faithful, I will restore manifold. I've always been, I've, I've always been very careful with my tithe. As I teach young ones, I think younger ones who want to build, I call it a spiritual portfolio. You know, there's something called portfolio. <laughs> well, I, we do it in architecture, I'm sure engineering and many of these professions. You have a portfolio in which you, you, you do things that will eventually will stand you in good stead, like a CV. And I found out that because you are faithful with what he has given you, God is under obligation to do great things in your life. I know it has been bastardized in some quarters and people try to people try to make it look like oh these people are just they want your money they, look let me tell you i don't want your money what i want is you because if i get you i got your money too <laughs> the bible says in first timothy 6 that i read earlier on in verse 18 it says you should, if you are rich it says you should do good be rich in good works ready to distribute willing to communicate laying up in store for yourself a good foundation against the time to come you lay up a good foundation for the time to come it's important for christians to know that there is a purpose behind the abundance and that's why i took up so many things which i will not tell you here because i try to help people here and there i've never borrowed for anybody I've never gone to the bank for bank uh, for loan. I've never had to crunch and to beg anybody for anything in my life. God, because of being a good steward, I don't do beyond myself. You will never see me do beyond myself. You know, some people they buy a car they cannot maintain. I cannot do that. Some people, all the money they have to buy the car, that's all they have. The money to buy petrol is not even there. You are living in a rented apartment. You can buy a very big car. That's doing beyond yourself. Some people like to do big man. Acting big man. <laughs> you will never find me in a class of people trying to impress anybody. No. No. If you see me have anything, I paid for it. Cash. And I pay, when, when, like when I buy some of my shoes and I go to the place, they tell you, if you want this shoe to be maintained, they give you all the things to use to maintain it. That's one of the problems of Nigeria. Nigeria doesn't know about maintenance. There's someone that wants to marry a wife. Don't just have money to marry. Have money to maintain the marriage. Can the women say amen to that? Some people marry a wife and then the next they say, where is money for, 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 for soup? They say, soup? I, I didn't know we were eating. <laughs> no, you don't do that. You tell the woman, when you're going to marry, I'm taking to my house. I'm going to be your husband. I'm going to do, 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 do. And the head of this one is, okay, no problem. At the fair, I wash your own. My wife will never allow you to go free. She says, I hear you when you teach this thing, so. <laughs> I used to teach my sisters, and uh, I said, don't allow your husband. 
So when it comes to my own turn, I say, I had you telling your sister. <laughs> Maintenance. People live beyond their means. People say things they cannot fulfill. People overstep even more than the grace of God that is available to them. And that's why many Christians are messed up. Not because God is not faithful. And when God promotes you, be faithful towards God. And then do what I'm going to use to close now. To be rich and not foolish, you must be rich towards God. My prayer in life, and one of my dreams as a young man, was that I would be able to give God one million naira. That was my dream as a young man when I was earning 50 naira, 500 naira. I said, God, give me money enough that I can give the church one million and I won't even think about it. I wasn't trying to be rich so that I would, I would live in a big house. No! I just wanted to be able to bless the work of God. I wanted to be rich towards God. This man's problem was that he was not rich towards God. And if a man is not rich towards God, he's going to offend God. Why she alone, God will not be happy. That's what we read from this man. Because I've never seen the Lord make a demand on the soul of a man like this in the entirety of scripture just have somebody die you don't know why sometimes we can see that god can demand and say mom but only my friend they're just wasting resources i said it and i will say it at the barrier that nobody dies without god actually approve it a christian god will approve it remember if you're a christian because the bible says precious in the sight of the law is the death of his saints nothing happens to christians that god doesn't know about now you are broke we've been praying for you from the beginning of this church that you don't be broke and you are still broke and we've seen people in this church that god has blessed we've seen people that god promoted lifted up from nothing to something we've seen people to whom god opened doors why is it that your own is different maybe you need to ask yourself some questions and stop blaming the devil and stop blaming uh, every other person except yourself are you rich towards god if god gives you the money you're asking for what will you do with it all you are thinking about is what I'm going to do to, in fact, they will get. That was the day I was ready, you know, in those days when I used to have a lot of time. When people buy new cars, I say, yeah, drive me your car. I enter the car, I say, drive me. So I just sit down there. I like, I like, if it's, it's a new car, I like it. I like every car, please. Even your kuja I like it. <laughs> So I, I sat down in this car and he was driving me and it was the days when new cars are not very common. So I was right down and we were going on. And the young man was driving and he put on the AC, you know, trying to impress me. Put on the AC, which is okay. You can impress your pastor, it's okay. But me, but to impress me, oh boy. <laughs> so he put on the AC and everything, and everything was cool and he put on good music. I said, ah, oh, this is nice. We're all enjoying inside the car. Then when somebody just crossed the road, he said, who is this? Why are you crossing my, 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 my front with your kuje kuje car? His heart is revealed. Kilola. The same kuje kuje, this own car is going to become kuje kuje very soon. Rich but foolish. Anyone that is not rich towards God, even though he's rich, is foolish. You must be rich towards God. You, you must. You're under obligation. What does it mean to be rich towards God? It means to honor the Lord with your substance. Honor Him. What does it mean to honor the Lord with your substance? That's what Proverbs 3 verses 9 to 10 says. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your, your increase. So shall the bands be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So shall your bands be filled with plenty. When you honor the Lord, he said he will. You see, when you honor him, what does it mean to honor him? Let me quickly address that. It means to give him your due. Give him his due. To honor God is to give him his due. Some people, all they think God, they owe God is their tithes. That's all. After that, God, did I more? As for me, I paid my tithes. <laughs> but is that his due? Yes and no. Yes and no. Some people eat their tithe. Some people eat their seed. The two of them eat. 
There are times that God will make a demand on you. Say, give me, maybe you got 10 million. He says, I want half of that money. He could. It depends on how you work with him. And depends on what he has in preparation for you. Give him his due. Uh, if you read the book of Malachi, Israel used to pay tithe. The same Malachi, the first chapter. He said some of them, they brought offerings that were blind. That is, it was a, a goat or a sheep or an ass that he said they should sacrifice. But that sacrifice was blind. I had only one eye. <laughs> you know? Or the thing was almost dead. Oh, if I could them, let's quickly sacrifice to the Lord. <laughs> so that the thing, they say, I brought my sacrifice. So then the priest will look at you and say, Ah, who Lord you come? The one that has only one eye is why you sacrifice to the Lord. <laughs> and God said, God said, no, 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 no. He said, if it was the governor, will you give the governor a goat of one eye? No, you won't. God will say, he said, if I'm your father, will you give me a goat of one eye? One blind, or sometimes the animal is totally blind. And he said, ah, this animal, give it to the Lord. That's some point to give pastor things. They look at the plates that, is, that has, they've used and used and used and used. And they give it to them. Pastor Egba, plate it you. That if the woman that made it sees it, he won't recognize it again. <laughs> is that his deal? Some offering are annoying to God. Say, so this is what I desire. This is what I desire. I said, I want to buy this screen. And someone said, ah, eh, what, what do you want to do? I remember we want to buy this building. I had some people say, ah, what are we going to buy that building for? We should, we should go to the village and do evangelism. They are not going to the village, they are not giving. I say, why, why are we buying all this building? Ah, why, why? We, 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 not, Christians are just enjoying themselves. They will not buy. They, <laughs> you know. We should do things that are due to the Lord. Because we are going to his house in heaven. And all this that you are gathering is just nothing when you compare to what we are going to get in heaven. Give him his due. Give him what is becoming of his blessing. That is when you measure the blessing of the Lord. As ah, this God has done so much for me. Give him a gift that is befitting of that. That's why when we say, when people get married, we say you should give something to God. When the men uh, do their uh, yearly whatever, the women, whatever you do, we say do something that is befitting. I can see two or three of you come together and say, hey, we want to buy this thing, 15 million. I'm, well, it's more than 15 now. Don't send any 15 million to me. It's about 20 or 25 million now, Mr. Salami. Where is the man? He has gone. Hey, Lincoln. This is the one that I say should help me get it to. 25 million. You can just come together and say, look, let's buy this thing and put it in God's house. Then we, we, we might not even mention your name, but God will recognize it. That is something that is becoming. Somebody did this stage for us. He didn't take a penny. And to do this stage to the stage where it is, it costs loads. I tell you, it's millions to do this stage. When the project was going on and I got stuck, I didn't have money to pay. He said, don't worry, Pastor, and he did everything. <laughs> he just did it. He didn't ask me for a penny up to today. So said, we'll just do it. I was thinking that uh, he would change his mind someday and say, oh, girl. But no. <laughs> now, that is something that is befitting my father's house. I know in churches where people just look around and say, oh, let's do this. I remember there was this pastor that was sharing this, an Anglican bishop. It's my friend. He was sharing the story. How they were able to finish their church, they were stuck at the stage and they didn't have money. And the, 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 the people had given, everybody had given, everybody had given. And then there was a wedding in the church. You know, if you go to an Anglican church or anything, they are always having building projects, Abby. They are always have they put that envelope. This man was in the congregation at the wedding and he wrote in the envelope. He said, I don't have money now. But if God pays me this money that I'm expecting, I'll finish this project. That was in the 80s, I think, or 90s. So they, they brought in all the envelopes and every envelope, only five naira, only 20 naira, everything. But this was saw this bit of paper on Monday morning. And as he was reading it, the man that wrote the piece of paper came to his office. 
and say, sir, I was when I wrote this. Is, I'm just reading your notes. Say, so how much we finish this building? He asked the pastor. Pastor say, uh, then 16 million. That was a lot of money. The man said, don't worry. I'm not even sure the man is a Christian. <laughs> You'd be surprised what unbelievers do. That this so-called born again cannot, cannot even do. And the man got it. I think he got the money that week. And he paid, he wrote a single check and gave it to the Anglican church. Not Pentiraskas. Just read the church for still new. Now, that is, God put it in his eyes. That's what God does. He has his, his work in mind. So he gives it into people's hands. Then those people must be faithful. But some of us, when we get the money like this rich fool, we, we take the money all right. Then we begin to say, tight. Tight is not a, is it 50, 10%? No. In Galatians, he says that uh, we're not under the law. Uh, it is then you remember you're not under the law. When, when you are praying, when you are praying, you knew you, you, you didn't care whether it was under the law or above the law. And people argue about tithe and argue about how giving to God. I say, I don't have, I don't have. Whenever there's a church project, I hear so. I just listen. When we were building the office tower, they had just came back from England then, and I was, there was no money anywhere. The church had reduced so drastically. Some people had left for all kinds of reasons. And I said, let's build that building. Somebody said, what, what do we need the building for? Of course, they speak behind my back. Oh. They speak in front of me. They, they will hear something. But I laid the foundation all the same. Trusting God. And we finished it. Because God put it, most of the people that gave us, if they interest you, were not even members of this church. Most. Somebody gave us 10 million. I'd never seen him before. Somebody gave us 5 million, this kind of money. Most of the people in the church that we thought should perform. Some even made some silly pledges. They didn't redeem. They've not redeemed up to today. And they sit on the chair that was bought with somebody's money. It's not good. We're not faithful. It's not that God hasn't blessed us. It's not that nobody had big money. No. The problem with us is that we are foolish. Oh, pastor, you're abusing me. No. It's God that says you are a fool. I speak for God. It's so sure. That's what Jesus said. That's what God said. You see, he said, I've done this, I've done this, I'm, I'm going to do this. And but God said. <laughs> That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Yeah. I want you to give to us all these things because God said to me, He said, I will put money in some people's hands. God said, I'll put money in some people's hands. If all you can afford is when you get your own, your own might not be 100 million, whatever it is, make sure you are faithful with it. It opens doors, it doesn't reduce you. I can tell you that from experience. It doesn't reduce you, it actually enhances you. Each time I'm giving large sums of money to God, I feel better. I feel happy that I'm able to advance the cause of Christ. I feel, oh, God must be happy with me. Not you. You don't even know how much anybody gives. You don't know how much I give. The only people that probably know in this church are the people that work with me in the office. <laughs> and I warn them, if they tell their husband or tell their wife, they'll see themselves. Because it is God I give it to. And you too should be the same thing. Some of us are blessed more than others. Some of us have more. We have more than other people. Let your church feel that something is happening in your life. The only thing we know is the car we see outside. The only thing we know is the house you build. That's all we know. We don't see it in the account. <laughs> That's not being wise. That's not being a good steward. That is being foolish. I speak to you as God's servant. That is being foolish. And I think I can speak to you. Let it be seen. Our brother is gone now. We'll be burying him on Friday. What can we say about him? It will come for every one of us sometime. The only thing you can say about him is what you do for God. That's all. And then he says, You live for yourself and inheritance in heaven. 
It's good that people commit themselves to God. But more important, commit your money to God. Some people are born again, but their money is not born again. I'm born again, I'm born again, but your money is not born again. And your money is a reflection of your life. You spend eight hours every day, one third, and some people work 24 hours actually for money. So whatever comes out of it must belong to God because that is your life. That is a reflection of your life. The labor, the effort, the education, the, the investment, the health he has given you, the strength he has given you, that is the reflection, the money that comes in. It's important that we get this right and have understanding. When the person has to understand, that's what I wanted to get this one, have understanding. I'm not telling you to give money today, have understanding. And then change your life and begin to order it that way. Then you begin to see the Lord will do the kind of miracles that he did for Abraham. At 100 years old, he's still bearing fruit. Like, like me now. These, are, these, these days, I, when I'm, I'm making more money. My wife will tell you. I'm able to, 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 to be a good husband now than I used to be. Was there anything you I said, is that what you want? You got it. Stand on your feet, everyone. <laughs> Stand on your feet, everyone. Talk to God for a minute and say, Lord, Lord, I give you my life. Give you my soul. I live for you alone. Oh, every moment I'm awake. Lord, I have your way. Oh!